Hi everyone. Good day to you all. You are most welcome to today's workshop slash webinar. And yeah, we are very excited to have Peter Singh with us. And today we'll be focusing on digital storytelling. Uh, most of you, you know, you struggle with taking very beautiful pictures and photos, using them on social media. Photos that speak to the audience. So today we are very proud and privileged to have Peterson with us, who will be taking us through this aspect of a skill most of us lack. In Africa, we like to do ceremonies a lot. So we say our chief special guest of honor, yeah. Mr. Peterson Toscana. Can we meet you, sir? <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, Peterson. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, San Bonani. I'm coming to you from uh, Mgwenya and Bumalanga, South Africa. Um, I have a mask on, not because of the virus, but because of internet viruses, right? I thought maybe <laughs> it would protect me. I don't think so. You never know, though. Um, I understand, like, people, it's hard with bandwidth to have video on all the time. So I will be showing you some images. Uh, and I'll turn off my, my screen when I do that so you can see the images. But first, thank you so much for having me today. It is a, it's a real honor to, to be with you. I've been watching with great enthusiasm the growth of CCL on the African continent. I have been a huge fan of David Michael for years now. He was one of the first guests on Citizens Climate Radio. Jacques will be a guest coming up very soon in April. Kathy Orlando has been a guest as well. And my job at CCL, uh, My job, it's somebody, someone needs to be moved. I don't know who that is. Roland Dedzi, petit, merci. And so my job at CCL is telling oui, stories. Là. Allô. My job in CCL is to tell stories. And, uh, and very often I do these through podcasts through, and through radio. Uh, and these radio stories get transmitted throughout the United States and, and beyond. Uh, and so before I go anywhere, I know we're going to have a question and answer period, but I recognize that you are all leaders in your world. You're leaders in, in the Women climate work that you do. And so I'm just curious about the questions you might have as you enter this this time. So I'd love it. I'm not going to answer those questions right now. I just want to hear what your questions are. That will help me to decide what to show you. So in the chat, if you have any questions at all about digital storytelling, about using images in storytelling, uh, about telling stories through the internet, put those questions in the chat and they will, and we'll have a Q&A at the end, but I want to hear those questions up front. All right, so feel free. I'm going to start, but just put those questions in and I'll be looking for those. The history of, of storytelling through art uh, and through images is ancient, as I'm sure many of you know. If, you know, here in, in Pumalanga in South Africa, there are images all over the place that come from, that come from, people writing on walls. And so the rock paintings are as a very huge part of the tradition. And I wanna show you a very, very short, some images of some, like some of these are like 6,000 years old of images that, that tell stories. And the San people here in Southern Africa, um, the understanding now is that these were images that came from the Sangoma or the, the healer who would have a dream and then share the images and the images would then be shared 
in this medium through paint, sometimes paint from animals' blood, sometimes clay. And these were, were put up on these walls so that people could you know, see these stories. These were some of the very first ways that our ancestors communicated visually. Uh, storytelling is ancient and visual storytelling is ancient. I'll show you two more images. The images were often about um, everyday activity. Animals were very often a part of these images uh, and hunting parties were part of it. But there were other uh, spiritual rituals. And even in this one, it looks like the image of, uh, of a birth. And, and there's so much going on. You know, there's thousands and thousands of these, and they are not just hundreds of years old. Uh, many of them are thousands of years old. And so this is a very powerful thing to tell a story through an image. Uh, and what we're trying to do with climate change is we're trying to tell a story that is very hard to tell, uh, especially hard to tell. And images have been used a lot to, to tell stories, but often, like, I don't know about you, but the image that I saw the most has been with the polar bear. Uh, and I would even imagine in, in parts of Africa, when you look at climate literature, you see polar bears. And it's so, I find it so funny because most of us never encounter polar bears ever. I joke that they're the second most privileged white mammal on the planet. And, uh, and yet we see them all the time in regards to climate work. I wanna show you an image that's a couple of hundred years old. It's actually the very first image that became uh, reproduced on a big scale to, to begin to tell people about an issue. And it's a shocking image. Uh, and it's an image that maybe some of you have seen before. Oh, let me make it a little bit smaller. But this image was created by abolitionists who were, were opposed to the kidnapping and the enslavement of, of humans from Africa. This image was reproduced literally thousands of times in that day. And what this image does, it is horrible, but it, they wanted to show the reality, the harsh reality of what's happening. And these abolitionists use this image as the first real meme that got reproduced. It was put onto walls and taverns. It was in newspapers. It appeared in books. And it drove home to people the inhumanity of, of this practice. I will provide you all the links to these images so you can go back uh, and see them. Another example of this is a little bit more modern, and it's an image that some of you may know, the, the AIDS ribbon, the HIV AIDS ribbon, which is just a little red ribbon. A lot of people don't know the story behind it though. In, um, you know, in the beginning with the AIDS crisis, no one wanted to talk about AIDS in the United States and in many places, and in part in the United States because it was associated with, with gays, with homosexuals. And it was a very taboo subject. So nobody was talking about it. And it was people were suffering. So a group of artists got together and they said, we need to have a symbol that will help people see this. And they decided a ribbon. And there weren't ribbons for a lot of things. There was a yellow ribbon for to support military. But they said, let's get a ribbon and have it. You can wear it. And they asked, well, what color? Well, the color needs to be red, they said, because it's about blood. And it's about love and passion. And to, to get people to see this, they decided that there was a big uh, award ceremony on television and they asked all the presenters to put this ribbon on. The, the organizers for the event were very unhappy about this. And they said, you can wear those ribbons but you can't say what they're about. So you had all these presenters with these ribbons on, uh, actors and people, and of course, it raised questions. People were like, well, what is this red ribbon? And that got people talking. Uh, and so that talking got people to you know, question, well, what, what, why are they wearing this ribbon? What's the problem? And that visual that people then were able to wear and reproduce uh, in lots of different places, that made a big, big issue. 
So I want to show you a video. Whenever I do a, uh, an episode of Citizens Climate Radio, I always produce a one minute video to, um, to capture like the essence of that show. And this particular one is unleashing our imaginations. And in, in telling stories, we need to be able to obviously use our imagination. Imagination is, is utterly critical. Uh, and, and in this, we, it talks about a thought experiment. Uh, and I just want you to just, if you're able to see the video, I'm not sure, I know it doesn't always stream for some people, but I'm just gonna play it, it's just one minute. It's our responsibility as climate communicators to be spreading climate hope, because otherwise we're in trouble. Just imagine this whole new world. What does the world sound like? What does your street sound like? What does the world smell like? It sounds like Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. That's what I hear. But more tangibly, I hear the sounds of children playing outside, laughing, free from environmental induced asthma, running around with not a care in the world, healthy. What does it smell like? It smells like fresh air. It smells like no toxic industrial fumes in our neighborhood. To me, that smells like possibility. I'm going to share with you uh, my own climate story. Uh, and I want to do it with some images uh, because, again, I think images are really powerful. Uh, and the images I like to use often are images that have people in them, and if possible, people I know. So, this is my climate story. In this picture, you see my parents, Pete and Anita Toscano. Uh, the little one at the bottom is my sister, Nardina. We're, um, my family's originally from Italy, but we grew up in America. I'm in this picture too. I'm in my mom's belly, not yet out into the world. My parents come from New York City. They, they grew up in New York City. When they married, New York was a very dangerous place. There was more corruption and crime, drugs and pollution. So they decided to move outside of New York City to the suburbs, uh, about an hour away in Stamford, Connecticut. My dad uh, worked with his hand. He was a carpenter and a welder, and my mom worked at home. And I think about my very first memory. We lived in this really wonderful neighborhood. It wasn't a big house for American standards. It was a very working class community. Uh, and I'm there in the center with the blue little bonnet on. I seem to like hats, I guess. Uh, and But unfortunately, my very first memory was not a positive one. For my mom, she loved this community. This is where all her friends were. She had a support network. The kids had lots of people to play with. But for me, my first memory was not a happy memory. The first memory I have as a child, I must have been three or four. And in the memory, I'm struggling to breathe. I feel like I'm suffocating, like I'm drowning underwater. And in the memory, there's also lots of uh, noise. It's scary. There's there's movement. Uh, I'm moving, being moved very quickly, and I feel a lot of fear. And I'm being rushed around. That I, I'm aware that I'm in a place without my parents. I was actually in a hospital, in um, in an oxygen tent because I was having an asthma attack, the first of many asthma attacks. And my mom realized that she was trying to get a better life for us, but that our neighborhood was actually very dangerous because even though there wasn't as much crime and all, there was still a lot of pollution. In fact, everyone in my class, I was the only white, white kid in my class. Everybody else was, was black and all of us had asthma. We all struggled with asthma, which is a very bad, difficult breathing disease. And I was constantly going to the hospital. I was constantly sick. And so my mom said, I need to do something. You know, moms and dads, they're like, we need to protect our kids. So she did something radical. When school was out, I was in first grade. So I was about you know six years old. She got us into the car and she left my dad at home uh, to keep on working. But she drove up to the mountains where my grandparents had just moved. And this was the countryside about two hours away. And to me, I hated it at first. It was dark, it was scary. There weren't a lot of lights. There weren't a lot of businesses. 
And we spent the summer there because it was school holidays and something extraordinary happened. I felt so much better. I got color in my face. I gained weight. I could run around and not pass out. Uh, when we got back to Connecticut, the doctor was amazed at how great I looked. But just a few weeks after getting back, we got, I got sick again. And my parents realized that for my health and then for my sister's health too, they needed to move. And it was hard to move because there weren't a lot of jobs up in the mountains. And it was a very hard time economically, but, you know, and it was very hard for my mom because she didn't have the support group, but our health was really important. And this story is my climate story because, or it's one of the climate stories, because I believe that no matter who you are, no matter where you live in the world, no matter how rich or poor you are, no matter whatever, you should be able to live in the neighborhood that you love and where you can thrive and you can be able to breathe deeply and, and enjoy life and be healthy. And that is why I'm fighting to put a price on carbon. That is why I'm fighting to decarbonize our economy because of our health and because of our children so that we can be strong and healthy and live in the places where we thrive. So I'm gonna stop that share for a moment. And I've got one other video to share, but before I go any further, I'm not sure how well you're hearing me, how well you're seeing things. Does anyone have any uh, questions or comments right now before I go any further? You could either unmute and ask or put it into the chat. Your audio is great if you wanted to know. That's good. Any questions yet? Kwame, are you asking a question? I see movement there. Good, you can hear me loud and clear. Ah, uh, yes, you have a question for me. Jacques, oh no, you're asking people if they have a question. So images are really important. And um, when I showed you that video, um, there were some beautiful images, the video. I wanna show you one more video uh, from a recent episode of Citizens Climate uh, radio. And um, this is um, a show I did about a woman who is originally from Nigeria. So, um, so some of you may even know who this person is. Uh, she lives in the States now and is doing some pretty amazing work. Uh, Sharona Schneider, and I will let her tell her story. One thing I love about people like you pursuing solutions to address climate change even when stretched by a challenge, you bounce back. This is definitely true of Sharona Schneider. Definitely in quarantine for the first few weeks, started feeling very depressed. Just to be someone who is so involved in the community and to not, no longer be able to be in those spaces with those people and doing the work that I was doing was very depressing for me and gave me a lot of anxiety, just wishing that I was out there taking action in a physical and tangible form. By picking up trash, you're making that a connection with your communities and your natural spaces. It becomes something that you fight and are determined to protect because you love it so much and you love the benefits, whether it's going on a hike and experiencing the sounds of nature or the waterfalls. No one wants to see a waterfall filled of trash. Now you may be wondering, you know, like, how do you make these videos? Does it cost a lot of money? How do you get all this stuff? It doesn't actually, that video cost me nothing to make. It cost nothing, just some time. And there is a wonderful website and I will definitely make sure you have the, um, the link to it. It's called headliner.app. And it's in this where I can create these videos. And I start with an audio file. And if you see at the bottom here, this is the audio file. And in this audio file, it's just, you know, the recording that I made for the, for the Citizens Climate um, Radio. And then to that, I begin to add 
images and they have a whole image library. So if I didn't like this particular video, I could look for something else and say, oh, I want a video of a bird. I don't know, let's see if there's a nice video of a bird. Uh, and first some images come up, but then I have videos as well that I can choose from. And this is again, free. I can just take this image and choose it and it will drop into the video. I'm personally happy with what I have, so I'm not going to use this one at all. Um, so, so this is a great tool. It's super easy. And I'm going to put it into the chat. It's headliner.app. There is a paid service where you get access to more stuff, but um, it, I've never needed that. Uh, and I often will ask guests to give me images of themselves because I want people to see who they are and they animate the images so that it just, it just flows. There are so many ways to, to tell stories visually, even if you do a tweet or in a WhatsApp message, just by adding, you know this, by just adding some emojis this really just helps to show the tone and how you're feeling about it. Uh, and uh, it could bring a little bit of humor. And when you're doing climate work, humor is really important because this is very hard work. It's not to make light of the situation, but humor can relax people and it could shed light on it. Um, just um, you know, a single image could be very powerful that you, if you put a tweet or something on Facebook and find, put an image, that's really wonderful. And there are places you can get free images. Um, one is pexels.com. I get lots of images there. They're free and they also have um, video. They just lend you to give credit to the people who, who put those images up. And very often when I do a tweet, I just make sure I get a really nice image to go with it. Uh, and it doesn't take that much bandwidth to put that up. Um, so those are so some, those are some of the ways that I'm using visual storytelling. Um, finally, like in in Zoom, um, Zoom is a visual medium, and so you know it's it's one thing to be able to see people's faces, but it's also really powerful to put images. Like when I told my story, I really told that story in five images, uh, and then I just use those images to draw people in. Uh, some of those were from my own life, and others that I got from places like like pixels and um, and there's no animation involved. And in, you know, even in um, something like Twitter, you could put three images and tell a story. They tell a story themselves and just add the text to that. Um, I have more stuff I can show you, but I'm just curious if, um, if folks have any questions or comments before I go any further. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Kwame, I can hear you. Yes, um, <laughs> interesting. Um, I must congratulate you for your short video. Um, you are a natural storyteller. Fortunately, Africa is full of stories. Yes. For some of us, you see, when we are able to capture events as they unfold and we arrange them timely so that they can make meaning for us to achieve a certain understanding, our stories flow. Unfortunately, in Africa, we do not document stories. And so what you have just showed us has actually encouraged me and my friends that we shouldn't just put certain things away and forget about that. If we arrange our history in the present, we'll be telling great stories for the future. And so you have made my day. And, and the, the, the headliner.com is something I, as a, as a platform, the type of platform I have been searching for all these years. Mm. And uh, 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 see how simply you have made it for me. And so um, I, I, I'm happy, I'm happy to be here. Now, my question is this. Can there be good stories and can there be bad stories? Ah, excellent question. Yeah. 
There can be. Um, I mean, good as in effective and bad as in uh, unhelpful, right? I mean, I try to train people at the US to tell better climate stories. And I get so frustrated at times, even as I direct them, because people feel trauma. And so the story that they keep telling is actually the same story over and over again with different details. They're telling the story about the impacts of climate change and how awful it is. And I understand that's an important story. The problem is it's a story that closes people up. It is a story that frightens people. And it's not about being dishonest. People need to know the truth, right? But they need to go somewhere with it. And so we can tell a story that then leads nowhere. The stories that motivate people are the stories of successes and the stories that reveal the impacts of climate solutions. So the story I told about my childhood and suffering with asthma, now that wasn't about climate change necessarily, but climate change is caused by pollution. Pollution causes other problems. And there was a solution in my case, I was able to move. A lot of people can't. Um, but here's the good news, we can tackle this, right? And when we do, the world will be a better place. Cities will be cleaner. They'll smell nicer. <laughs> People will be happier. That's an, that's an encouraging story. Even if someone wasn't concerned about climate change, they want that. And in a way, the stories we tell should re reveal what we're fighting for. And I learned this um, from my partner who is originally from South Africa and who was part of the anti-apartheid struggle in college. At the end of every rally they had, somebody's job was to come up and share what the new South Africa was going to look like. And this person's job, no matter how hard things were, and it was often very hard, their job was to, to share the vision. You know, the new in the new South Africa, we will be able to move freely. In the new South Africa, we will have this, we will have that. They painted the picture of what they're fighting for. That motivates people. And if you can tell a story about why you're doing this, even if it's a story that originally comes from pain and suffering, but one that motivates you to make the world a better place. Um, uh, Jacques uh, Kenjio will be on the show in April and he tells a story about Cameroon and land that gets taken over and it's, it's a tragic story, but it's also a story that motivates people to want to do the right thing. And, to, and, and so any story that can get people to dream and to long for something better and, and not just feel the weight of the pain and the injustice, that's a story that can get people moving in the right direction. I, I, like, I like that question a lot. Uh, and, and finally, the other thing I'd say is always try to put some emotion in your story, even if you're a scientist, right? And you're sharing the science behind climate change. Let people see a little bit of your heart so that they see that you are tenderhearted, that you're moved by this. That will help them to feel and have empathy, not only knowledge. Great. Thank you, Kwame. You're welcome. Josephine, you have a question. You have your hand up. What would you like to say, Josephine? Josephine, if you have something, feel free to unmute and ask or say your comment. Josephine, you are muted. There okay. you go. Hey, Josephine. Jacques, I, I see. Hi, okay. hi. Okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think this is a wonderful presentation. Actually, my students, they are in a competition, you know, global competition, which uh, they are going to submit a story. It's a digital story. So I've learned one or two things, even the apps that you, you showed, I think we'll use the app. But I 
wanted to ask, what, what is pitch video? Pitch video. What do they mean by that? What is it? Pitch video, did you say? Yes, sir. Like P-I-T-C-H, pitch video? Yes, 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 sir. The only, the only way, I don't know exactly what they're referring to, but like if you pitch the idea of a video, it's like you're putting an idea out there. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what that is. Now, Stitch, I know what that is. Um, but as you're speaking, another tool that can really help people build creative videos is actually TikTok, which is huge and popular in Africa, uh, everywhere. But, you know, there's a huge like Nigerian TikTok and South African TikTok that has some great tools on there that you could actually create visual stories. But as pitch, I don't know. I don't know what they're referring to about pitch. Same here, but we're still working on it. I, I don't, is that, well, we'll get to it anyway. Well, this has really exposed uh, more information and guided us to what we'll do. We really appreciate Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. I see Kathy Orlando has a question um, about if people take their own pictures, are there some guidelines? Have you ever told a story not on video, but on social media with visuals and short blurbs of writing? If so, do you have any suggestions on how to make them impactful? Um, you know, with, with pictures, I think it's always important to have people's permission to share the picture if it's of somebody else uh, and, or if it's somebody else's picture to give credit. That's really important to do. Uh, and you want to make sure that your images reflect your organization and the values of that organization so that you know it's respectful just like how you would show up for an event there's a certain way you would dress and behave your images should also dress and behave that way i have definitely told stories uh, with just images uh, it was very popular not too long ago for people to do memes where it's just an image with some words and uh, I've done, you know, a, a lot of those, um, you know, where I just have an image and then you can just superimpose words on it. There are apps to create memes. The meme is M-E-M-E-S, -E -E I put it in the chat. You can look for uh, apps to create memes and it's excellent. It's just, you know, like it could be so simple as like a picture of your face looking sad and just say, I'm sad because you're not doing anything about climate change. Uh, make me happy. Uh, it could be something so simple as that. Uh, and, you know, to make our images impactful, um, people are looking at things on little screens. So whenever you can crop that your image so that you're getting as close as possible to the action. Um, so, you know, when I say crop, like, you know, like if your image is small in the background, bring it up closer. You can make it shorter and there are tools uh, on you know again on apps you can have or on computers to crop a picture so that you get the most compelling part of it and cut out all the extra stuff that's not really important to the image bye jacques au revoir i'm glad you were able to be here i i think i'm out of time david michael i don't want to take too much of your time so let me know uh, when to stop um Thank you so much, Peters. And this, I, I, I'm just wishing we did a broadcast of this um, via Facebook or Twitter, so that many other people, you know, we will learn from it. But I'm happy we have a video we can show. This is a great resource. Thank you very much. I was going to call uh, on Mohammed uh, Admaruf to say a word of thank you to you, but uh, the thank you. Uh, expressed by Kwame and Josephine are uh, just quite enough. I was just wondering, Jax, if there are, oh, Jax is off, if there are questions in French. Um, but if not, we have barely 15 minutes to the end of this call. And um, Kati, you are going to close us with uh, news happening around. Uh, at the moment, I am going to briefly share my screen, guys, and we talk about the next action for, for Africa. So last year, we carried out an action writing letters to our various countries, requesting them to 
join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. Now, next week, Friday, March 19th, is Global Day of Climate Action, the school strike. And I know that a few groups have prepared for their climate shoe strikes. But I just want to see if we can add something to it. And what are we adding? So a few of you have seen the article that was shared on our WhatsApp platform, on Twitter, that I wrote requesting the Nigerian government to include carbon fee and dividend in their indices. So at the moment, it is only four African countries that have submitted their revised indices. And most countries have between now and June to do so. What is interesting is that COP26 is about Article 6. And everything about that article is carbon pricing. And our continent is lagging behind. And this is where the danger is because most of the countries of the world that we do business with, the G7 countries, they are all considering carbon finance, carbon fee and dividend. And there comes the border adjustment program. And that is what we hit Africa very hard. And so, this is what I'm proposing we do alongside uh, our climate strike. This can actually be our climate strike. So the whole of next week, we have developed a letter explaining what carbon fee and dividend is requesting our various governments to include this in our indices. So I'm requesting all national coordinators, all group leaders in our respective countries, just the way we sent letters last year, requesting our countries to join the Carbon Leadership Coalition. We do the same requesting that carbon finance, carbon fee and dividend be included in our country's indices. I refer to it as climate income, which makes a lot of sense to, to most people. If you check through the CCA International website, the CCA Africa Twitter handle and all, you see where a senator in the US, Senator, uh, Mike Romy, from Utah, a Republican, who is giving an endorsement of the carbon fee and dividend policy. And I know that just like Canada, in no time, the US will. Of course, the US is part of the G7. So what do we do? For those who are interested, I will share the letter with you. Oh, sorry, the wrong one. <laughs> I will share the letter with you if you are interested. Deliver the letter to the government agency in your country responsible for revising the NDCs. In Nigeria, I guess is the Ministry of Environment. Take a picture just the way we did. If you are able to meet anyone, take a picture, or you take a picture in the process of delivering the letter, we'll keep it. And then on March 19th will be the day we will do all the tweets. If you are very far from the capital, you're not able to, you have the address, 
you can send this and then we'll follow up with a Twitter action on March 19th. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think this is a lovely idea and we can get, uh, we can't wait to go to work. Thank you. Any other comment? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a good idea. And I think it is now we can move, we can move ahead. Just make sure we submit the letters. I am ready to meet all the stakeholders involved in this mission to make sure we thank have you, it Thank you, Nigeria. Our... Thank you, Gambia. Any other last comment? Who is against this and tell us why? Uh, hello? Yes? Uh, yes, we, in Togo, we, we think that it, it is a good idea. Also, you can send the letter with uh, me and uh, we will uh, take it to the minister. All right. So guys, now you understand how to take very good pictures. You understand how to tell your stories. So we we'll have a two-way thing. After submitting the letters during by next week, Friday we'll follow them up with tweets and put it out there. And we hope that the, the, the Friday for Future Network will help amplify our voices and put it out there and let the entire world know what you are doing in your respective countries and what is going on in Africa and we keep pushing. Thank you very much. Um, we have very few minutes to the end of the call. Uh, Kati, you, talk, you can end this call by briefly giving us a general uh, news of what is happening at CCL International, and then uh, a brief about the March 31st strategy meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was a, a wonderful call. Thank you, Peterson, for being here today and everyone for uh, all that you're doing. Um, uh, there's so much to report, so I'm going to have to leave a lot of things out, but perhaps of interest to you all, we launched chapters in Tanzania, Ivory Coast, Ghana, and the eighth chapter in Nigeria. Uh, in, in the last week or so. So uh, bienvenue and welcome to CCL, all our friends there. Um, we, uh, if you missed it, our, our Fridays for Future uh, Colombia is closely associated with Citizens Climate Lobby Colombia. And one of their volunteers is 11 year old Francesco Vera Menze Manzanares. And he is now the goodwill ambassador to the European Union. That is one of our CCL members in Colombia. That is just astounding. Uh, Franz Francesco is probably the lead youth climate activist. There's a couple others. I shouldn't say he's the only one um, in Colombia. Um, we're just doing fantastic work, raising awareness and creating community in Colombia alongside many other NGOs. On the weekend, um, we, we had a workshop for Oceania and Asia. It was really good. It was similar to the ones that we've been holding. Um, and Japan, India, Australia, Bangladesh were there. And I'm meeting with the leaders from CCL in Pakistan and Singapore in the next uh, 48 hours. So, um, and they just are outlining similar plans and Many of them are taking the lead from what you are doing in Africa, really admiring your work, uh, uh, speaking with the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition and just working cohesively as a continent that is really empowering um, uh, uh, for them. And then so much more to report, um, but I'm gonna end with, um, a story that, um, like David Michael is saying, uh, carbon pricing is coming to the, you know, and it's getting bigger and more and more the planet, the uh, countries are pricing carbon pollution. And on uh, Friday morning, I was the border carbon adjustment and Canadian carbon pricing expert on a call, which included at least a dozen members of European Parliament um, discussing uh, 
carbon pricing in Canada, which is the climate income policy, and how my government is looking closely at border carbon adjustments. So, um, and why are they doing that? Um, because a really robust uh, but gradually increasing price on carbon pollution will, will really do most of the heavy lifting for reducing carbon emissions. And by giving the money back to the people, we truly reduce income inequality or we, we help lift people out of poverty a little bit. Maybe not enough, I think, but still it's a, it's a good step forward. Um, everybody gets money um, and, uh, I, and there's a lot of political will for it in Canada. So lastly, I, I'm gonna put Kati, you're muted. Um, oh, so, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I accidentally hit mute. Okay, so lastly um, is the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference on March 31st. Um, and we invite you to, to come to this. Your stories from Africa, your what you are doing in each of your countries is empowering the rest of the world. And I think hearing other people's stories will be good too. So I invite you to join us on March 31st. And I am finished. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. So um, one last announcement. We will be discussing uh, climate income next week, uh, March 19th. Uh, that webinar is targeted at Nigeria. Uh, people requested for it when they read my article and it's open to all um, who will be interested to, to join. I will share the link with you all. Uh, Kati, can we do a group photo? And then we leave. Everyone turn on your videos. Kwame, your video, Francis, your video, Kojo, oh, your video, everyone. All right. So, Kati, let's do it. Oh, wait, wait for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have video that's in. Okay, okay, okay. It's, 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 it's. Is it on now? Uh, off again. Turn it on. Off again. Yeah, it's off. Is it on now? No, but we can see your photo. Oh, no, All right. No. It's okay, now it's, it's on now. Can you see All me now? Right, Kathy, let's do it. Good. Okay, so let's do a thumbs up or a peace sign. Yeah. yeah? What? A peace sign. Cool. Yeah. Okay, ready? Uh oh, yeah. I lost it. One, yeah. two, three. Now. Okay, that's great. Thank Good. you. Do have a great evening. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peterson. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mommy. Thanks, yeah. David, yeah. so much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>